Hi, it's Dr. Robert Syker with episode number 21 of the Doctor Podcast Show. Thanks for tuning in. Today we have a great guest, Dr. Theodore Schwartz, who is a professor of neurosurgery at the Weill Cornell Medical Center. Dr. Schwartz specializes in minimally invasive neurosurgery, especially neurosurgery for patients who have brain tumors of various types. He is very innovative in finding new techniques and technologies to operate on these patients and uh, help save their lives. And uh, uh, he's been of great, tremendous uh, benefit to these patients. Thanks for coming uh, today to speak with us. Thanks you're, for having me. Yeah, you're a very busy guy, so we really appreciate the time. So looking at your credentials, I reviewed them. I noticed that you graduated magna cum laude from uh, Harvard uh, University. And usually people who do that wind up being rocket scientists. But instead, you decided to go to Harvard Medical School and then become a neurosurgeon. Why did you do that? Yeah, you know, I couldn't make it in rocket science. It's just too difficult, too challenging. I was kind of the black sheep of my family, so they didn't talk about me much, but I ended up as a brain surgeon. I see. So why did you decide to do neurosurgery as opposed to other specialties in medicine? Um, you know, I thought about neurology, I thought about infectious diseases, there were a lot of things that interested me, but the first time I went into an operating room and I saw the human brain exposed, and I saw, you know, a surgeon literally just sitting there like this, barely moving with these magnifying glasses on their eyes, looking at the human brain, manipulating it, and then going under a microscope and sort of zooming in on the brain, I was smitten. You know, and I had no choice, honestly, at that point. Once you, once I saw neurosurgery, there was nothing else I wanted to do. Right. The training for neurosurgery is, is very grueling and demanding and rigorous. I remember when I was a medical student, they told me what it's like. I said, I don't know if I, if I could do that. Tell us about how many years of training it takes to become a skilled yeah. neurosurgeon after medical school. So I had the same trepidation. I wasn't sure that I could handle the training, honestly. And I had a lot of other interests before I went into medical school. I was really interested in music. I loved playing the bass guitar and you know reading books and doing things. Right. And I sort of felt like if I went into neurosurgery, I was going to give up my entire life, all my interests. And and to some extent, that is true. Right. Um, it is a period of time where you really have to give up almost everything else and devote yourself to it. There's a one-year internship, and then there's a six-year residency, and that's after four years of med school. So when I finished everything, I was about 33 years old. So my 20s are a blur. Like, I really right. don't remember them. I was living in the hospital. Um, but you make a life for yourself doing that. And I think at some point, you give yourself to it. You know, when you first start out, you fight against that. You try to pretend you can still lead a normal life and be a neurosurgery resident. And then at some point you realize you can't, but then there's sort of this stage of acceptance. It's like the 12 stages of becoming a neurosurgery resident where you finally accept that like, this is your lot in life. You're gonna live in the hospital for a little while. And once you do that, you realize all the amazing things that you're doing and you're learning and what an incredible field it is. So it was challenging. It's a very difficult period of time. I can't tell you it was fun the whole time. It really wasn't. There were some miserable points to it. Right. Um, but in the end, the, you know, the training you get is remarkable, and you have this skill that you learn that very few people know how to do, and there's a wonderful feeling to that. Yeah, I, I read, I got an advanced copy of your book called uh, Gray Matters, uh, Biography of Brain Surgery, which is coming out in August, I believe, right? Yeah. And it's actually available on Amazon now if you want to uh, pre-buy it. And uh, I read the section of, of where you train and what the on-call was like. Can you tell us what that was like, being on-call, and how often you were on-call? Sure. Call? So um, when I trained, we were on-call every third to every fourth night. It varied. And so what that meant was you'd work all day, you'd do all your work, and then everyone would leave the hospital except for you, you know, and you would carry this beeper. And anytime anything happened in the hospital related to any neurosurgery patient, someone came into the emergency room, anything, your beeper would go off. So you might try to go to sleep and you'd catch an hour or two and your beeper would go off and you'd have to run down to the emergency room, see a patient, you'd have to go put an IV in. Whatever you have to do, you have to do. Um, and then, you know, maybe you get an hour or two of sleep and the next thing you know, it's seven in the morning and you don't get to go home Right. and go sleep for the day. You actually, that's when the work day starts, so you just kind of start again. Um, we used to joke that uh, a, a shower was worth about two hours of sleep. So 
it, it would be worth it to wake up you know, a half an hour before round started just to get a shower because that was like an extra two hours of sleep because it would give you just that little extra bit of, of energy. But it, it was tough. Um, there was a lot of my co-residents who, you know, got very frustrated and would, you know, throw things. And, you know, there's some stories about, you know, chart racks being thrown and telephones being broken and things like that. Because you just get, you know, you get, when you're so sleep deprived, you can't control your emotions to some extent. Right. Um, and so, you know, you look back, you sort of forgive them for it. Um, and it's tough. It's tough to give up your life or work that hard for such a long period of time when you're in the prime of your, of your youth, you know. But it does allow you to develop certain skills and ability to concentrate under extreme situations, like when you're operating on someone's brain. Isn't yeah. that right? And we'll operate for hours, you know, at a time. Um, and, you know, some people say, like, how do you, how do, you do that? Like, you can't go to the bathroom, you can't eat anything. Um, but you kind of get in this state of focus where, you know, you're concentrating only on this one task at hand. And I, you know, I, I kind of liken it to if you were a kid and you would like build, you know, model ships, you know, and you'd follow the directions and you'd be there building your ship. And next thing you knew, like four hours had passed and you were right. working on whatever the thing is that you work on. Um, it could be practicing an instrument if you're, you know, a, a take to music and, and, and piano playing or whatever it is. So... Time just passes and you get in this zone, this flow state where you're just focused on kind of fighting against the anatomy of the patient and their brain and the tumor you're trying to take out and figuring out what the normal anatomy is and the abnormal anatomy. And you try one thing and it, it doesn't work and you try something else and then you find a pathway that works and you sort of keep going in that direction. And so that whole process um, is almost like this zen-like meditative state and time just passes. You don't even realize it. You don't realize you have to go to the bathroom until the case is over, you know, and then you right. kind of stand up and you're like, oh my God, my shoulder is killing me, you know, my back because I haven't eaten anything. Um, but for that period of time, you're so engrossed and enmeshed in what you're doing, that the outside world does not exist. It's right. gone. Right. You mentioned that you operated today. You did a very long case. Can you tell us about that? This was some kind of a tumor that you specialized in? Yeah. So this, um, you know, you're an ophthalmologist. Right. And so, as you know, there are a lot of tumors that push on the optic nerves. And um, I see a lot of patients, that's one of my specialties, patients who are losing vision because they have something pushing on their optic nerves. And it's not an easy place to get to necessarily, right? Because the brain's on top of it and the eyes are in front of it and the nose is below it. And so there are a million different approaches to, to get us there. Um, the traditional approach was we'd just make a big incision here. And we'd come in around the brain and we would move the brain out of the way and kind of find our way around. And the optic nerves would be there sort of sitting in your way and you take a tumor out. Um, and about 25 years ago, people started to think about other ways to, to do that. And one of those ways is to go up through the nose because you can go in through the nostrils and put an endoscope, which is a long, thin telescope, up through the nose, not make any incisions at all, and you can actually get to the optic nerves on both sides from below. But if you have a tumor pushing on the outside, coming from below is not going to help. So we developed another way to do that in conjunction with oculoplastic surgeons. Not, you know, I started doing it, but there are other surgeons around the world who do it, where you can make little incisions just in the eyelids, which is like cosmetic surgery. If you right above up, the eyeball. Right above the eyeball mm -hmm. in the eyelid. Um, it, so you don't see the incision at all afterwards, because when you open your eyes, the, the skin crease covers it. And you can actually get to the optic nerves from the outside by going through the eyelid. So, and again, we use endoscopes to do this. We make very small incisions. The endoscope um, is like the diameter of a pencil. Um, it's like the scope, like a laparoscope, or if you have your gallbladder removed. And we can see through that. Um, and we can access all these places in the skull base now without making any incisions or making very, very small incisions in the eyebrow, the eyelid, um, or just go right up the nose. So that was the case that we did today. Right. How long did that take it? You know, I work with other surgeons in a lot of right. these cases. So the whole operation took six, seven hours. But honestly, I was in there for 45 minutes through the nose part, and I was probably in there for another you know, hour through the eye part because the other surgeons were doing what they needed to do to get me there. And that's also the beauty of doing these minimally invasive approaches is that when we come in from here, you know, you start from the beginning and it takes you an hour and a half just to get to the optic nerves, you know, when you start the operation. But here I have another surgeon who does the approach for me through the nose. And then I come in and I just do the critical part. You know, I'm just drilling out the bone over the optic nerve and taking the tumor out. And that can often be done fairly quickly if, you, you know, if you're good at it and you've been doing it for a while. Because right. it's the approaches, it's getting there, that really is a lot of the work of neurosurgery. Right. Now, you specialize in minimally invasive surgery, specifically of, of brain tumors, right? Yeah, that's correct. So these incisions are much smaller. The recovery is, therefore, quicker. Right. Patients get out of the hospital faster 
um, the recovery is faster, and you don't compromise anything. Well, that was the initial thought when you're going through the nose or through the eyelid, can you really take the tumor out? The truth is it, it gets us um, a trajectory that you can only get through that approach. Right. So we actually can often take out more of the tumor and do a better job than we can coming in from the more traditional approaches where we go in on the side of the head. That's pretty amazing. Optic nerves are very delicate, so you have to have incredibly steady hands, and you're doing this all under high magnification and being extremely careful not to touch or annoy the optic nerve because if it's damaged, it doesn't recover. That's so, correct. So this is uh, very critical because you want to get rid of this brain tumor but also preserve the vision. Uh, the, uh, what are some of the more other common conditions that you do? What kind of uh, brain tumors and other yeah, so things you operate the, on? The, the two most common brain tumors we see are either one called a glioblastoma, which is a malignant brain tumor that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, people like Ted Kennedy died of a glioblastoma. McCain died of a glioblastoma. Bo Biden, Joe Biden's son, died of a glioblastoma. A lot of people you know, have faced this disease Right, I read that in your book. You yeah. have a section about different politicians and celebrities who had uh, brain tumors right. and glioblastomas. Yeah, yeah, um, and you know it's a it's a horrible disease because it is surgically operable. Um, we can take it out, but there are microscopic cells that are usually left behind at the end of the operation, and we can treat those with chemotherapy and radiation. But often the tumors grow back, you know, and so it's one that we have a hard time curing. So we can. Um, extend life, we can maintain quality of life for a period of time. We do have some long-term survivors that are these miracle cases that no one really knows why they survived so long. They didn't right. get anything special, no special clinical trial. Um, so there's the glioblastoma on the one hand, um, and then there's a meningioma, which is a benign tumor, which is the other most common. Those are the two most common tumors we take out. And meningiomas are benign in that you know, they, they push on things like the optic nerves, you can lose your vision. But if you take the whole thing out, you can actually cure someone. And even if you can't take the whole thing out, you can radiate what's left behind to prevent it from growing back. So if it doesn't grow back for the rest of their lives, they're essentially cured, even though there's a little tumor left behind. So those are the most common ones. And then the other more common, very common tumor I take out is called the pituitary adenoma, which right. is a fascinating... You specialize in pituitary surgery, yeah. and that sits also between the two optic nerves. Yeah, so often... an extremely delicate area. Patients come in, they're losing vision. In fact, you'll appreciate this. I wrote a paper on it. A lot of my patients come in, and they're like, you know, Doc, I losing my vision, I went to see an ophthalmologist, and he said I had a cataract. Mm -hmm. So I had cataract surgery, and I didn't really get any better. <laughs> so then I saw someone else, and they were like, well, maybe you should get an MRI scan. You know, and sure enough, they have a big tumor pushing on their optic right. nerve. So we go in, and you, those are another case you can take out through the nose, you don't make any incisions, you can take the whole thing out, you can cure them, and you can restore their vision dramatically, which is really an incredible feeling, um, and I'm sure you get that as well as an ophthalmologist. You know, vision is is the most important sense that we have. A third of the brain is dedicated to processing vision. Right. And when you're losing your vision, you know, it's a, it's a disaster. You can't watch TV, you can't read, you can't get around. Um, and when a patient comes in and they're losing their vision, and you can do a surgery, and they wake up in the recovery room, and they're like, oh my God, I can see. You know, it's an incredible feeling. It's so rewarding as a, as a physician to be able to restore vision to someone who's losing it. So, right. One of the other fascinating things I read in your book is, is you mentioned that one of your biggest rewards is when you get a hug from a patient and patient's family after yeah. spending a whole day in the yeah. operating room. That hug is, is everything, right? I mean, that's the payment, right? That's, that's the, what we get back for doing this. It's why we do it, you know, um, and it's the best because it, it's incredible how often it happens. You know, you sort of... And, and often you don't know these, you don't know the patient's families that well. You've met them once in the office for right. half an hour. You met them for 10 minutes before the operation, you know, where you mark them and talk, say, this is what we're doing, got to sign consent. Um, and obviously this brain surgery is one of the biggest days of their lives and their families' lives. And their families are terrified. You know, they don't know, they don't realize that, the, that their loved one is going to come out of the operation and be the same person they were before. Because we think about brain tumors and brain surgery as, you know, that's who you are. And if there's a problem, you know, you could wake up as a different person and not be able to talk, not be able to move, right. not recognize, you know. So when you come out of the OR and you say, hey, everything went great, they're going to be fine. There's this, you can just sense it, it's palpable, the relief that the family members have. Um, and they literally are just like, can I give you a hug? I'll just ask you. 
you know, and it's this beautiful moment where I'm like, absolutely, you know, and they just, this like relative stranger just like reaches out and starts hugging you. It's great. It's beautiful. Yeah, there's nothing like it. Yeah. Very, very rewarding. One of the other things that was fascinating in the book is you mentioned that uh, in many types of surgery that you do, the patient is actually awake and you need them awake, yet you're operating on the brain. Can you explain how you can operate on somebody's brain while they're awake yeah. they and they don't feel anything and what the advantages of having the patient awake while you're operating yeah. on their brain? So um, the, the times when you need someone awake or when you're operating on a tumor, and often a glioblastoma or sometimes on some of these epilepsy patients, um, where the tumors are near parts of the brain that are important for language. And, and what's interesting about brain organization is there are very specific parts of the brain that we know are important for language. And I, I write about in the book, like we discovered them and how we know about that and the different neurosurgeons who figured it out. And it turns out that language is actually in a slightly different place in everybody. It's not in exactly the same place. Now, there's some things like the part that moves my left arm is more or less always in the same spot. And we can figure that out. Um, but the language in the temporal lobe could be almost anywhere. You know, it's within an, an area that's about four or five centimeters, um, but we don't know exactly where. So if you're taking out a tumor near those areas, you need to have the patient awake so you can map that out, so you can know exactly where it is. And the way we do that is, first of all, we give them a lot of local anesthesia, right? So the scalp is totally numb. Um, we give them IV drugs so they kind of fall asleep when we're doing our opening and the drilling and all that. Everyone's asleep for that. But then at some point, we wake them up. You know, and the pain and the brain has no pain fibers, so it turns out you can they can touch the brain. Um, it doesn't have sense fibers either, and you wouldn't even know that I was touching your brain if I actually touched your brain because it doesn't have those receptors there, so it doesn't know. That's amazing. It controls the pain sensation everywhere else in the body, but it doesn't actually have its own pain sensation. Doesn't have the sensors, right? Right. And so. Um, you have them awake um, at that point, and then there's a conversation, right? That's a whole process of like slowly waking them up because they don't really know where they are. You know, they're lying on a, on a bed. Their head is fixed in clamps. We put these clamps that literally have like spikes on them, three spikes to fix their head so they can't really yeah. move their head. Right. Um, and sometimes they wake up and they're a little like, where am I? And they start moving their arms. You really have to kind of calm them down and say, well, we're in the operating room, remember? Um, but once they calm down and they realize it and they wake up more, then you can have a conversation with them like, you know, it's a, uh, you know, what did you, what did you do last night? You know, did you go to the movies last night? And, and you kind of want to do that. But then when you start, um, you want to make them comfortable. When you start mapping the brain, the way it works is you'll have a, a neuropsychologist or someone showing them pictures. There's a lot of ways to do it, but the most common way, they show them a picture of an object. You say, and they name it, and they say, this is a car, this is a dog, this is a ladder. And while they're naming these objects, you take a electrode that either has one contact or two contacts, and you basically stimulate the brain, and you march around the brain. When you get to the part of the brain that's really important for speech, the patient will say, this is, um, um, uh, and, and they just, they can't get the name out. And it's a phenomenon we've all had, because we've all forgotten the names of objects, right? So they don't realize why they can't, access that name because right. often you'll be at a dinner party and like someone will walk in and you'll be like who's that again like I forgot their name or you know so it's that same feeling um, that we call like the tip of the tongue you can't quite get it um, but you know that that's an important area so you, you put a little marker on the brain or you, you can actually cut out a little number put like a number so we mark you can mark the brain um, and then you march around you map out the whole thing you figure out where the language areas are you figure out where the tumor is you want to take out you can't get too close to those and then you go, you know, and you resect what you can. So it's it's basically marking the areas of the brain so you know exactly uh, where you are. So it's like Google Maps during, Correct. during yeah. surgery. Yeah, they're yeah. landmines. You gotta figure out where the landmines are to avoid them. And so same thing with motor. If you stimulate the part of the brain that moves the arm, you know, you sort of, the arm moves. You, you can map out, you know, the fingers, the hand, the face, all of that can be mapped out sensation. You can map out a part of the brain where the hand feels or the foot feels, if you want to make a very detailed map to save all of that um, so that when you take out your tumor, you don't affect any of those functions. Right. Now, occasionally, tumors invade those areas, though, and then, then it's a problem when right. patients have some deficits. Right? Often, the tumor will cause a deficit, um, and then you don't want to make that worse. So those are those situations where we leave the tumor behind, right? Um, because we may not be able to cure them anyway, right? If it's a glioblastoma, if we take out try to push that limit so there's no reason to leave them with a neurologic deficit. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. 
there are a lot of new technologies that are coming out in neurosurgery and in medicine in general. What, what new things are, are you working with? Because I know you're uh, the vice chairman of clinical research in yeah. neurosurgery there as well. So yeah. what's happening? A um, couple of things. So, um, you know, robots and lasers are always a fun, exciting thing to talk about. Right. So um, we don't do that much robotic surgery in neurosurgery, but we do now have robotic arms that help us put electrodes in. So for epilepsy, for example, when you want to figure out where um, seizures are coming from, and so what a seizure is, is basically a part of the brain that where the neurons start to fire out of control. Um, and often there's some diseased tissue there, there's a scar, there's a problem there. Sometimes you don't know exactly where it is because you can't see it on an MRI scan, but you have to find it because if you can remove that area, you can cure them of their epilepsy. So we do a surgery where we want to put electrodes all around the brain and we can basically, on a computer, map out where we want those electrodes to start and stop, put that information into a computer. And then the computer will basically take a, uh, a laser um, image of the face, know where everything is in the head, and then a robotic arm, you push it, you step on a, a pedal actually, and a robotic arm will move right to that area. And then you mm -hmm. drill a hole in the skull, put the electrode in. And then you, you tell it, go to the next one, and it'll go zzz, 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 and it'll tell you, you put the electrode in there. So we do have robotic arms that we use, which is kind of fun in the operating room. Um, and you have to trust it, that's the other thing, right? You're trusting, the robot's saying put it here. And so I'm drilling a hole in the skull and I'm putting an electrode there and hoping the robot knows what it's doing. And it, it does get it right all the time, but there is this yes. element of trust, you know? And then um, lasers is another thing. So we can now, um, when you find an, a part of the brain that causes epilepsy deep in the brain or a small tumor, we can use that same robot and advance a laser probe deep in the brain and basically burn that tumor from the inside out. Mm -hmm. um, and we can do that in an MRI scan, or so patients in the MRI scan, and we can burn the tumor and then we can image it on the MRI scan. So we can actually see, we do what's called MR thermography. We can make a heat map of the heat from the laser burning the tumor and we can see how far it's going. And then when it gets to the point where we want to stop, we just stop the laser and we're done. Pull it out and move on. That's pretty amazing. You mentioned that there's not that much actual robotic surgery going on in the brain. Is that because the it's very tiny and even the robots yeah. aren't really So ready? the Da Vinci robot, which is the main robot we use for prostates, we use right. it for heart, we can use it you know, in the, in the um, ovaries and things like that. You know, the, the way it's designed, it's designed by a company for that, and the arms are pretty far apart. And the scope is a pretty big endoscope that they put in there to see. Right. And because of the trajectory of the arms, the trajectory we need for neurosurgery is like this. It's very, very small. Right. And so those arms just don't work um, in the brain. They didn't build it. They could. One could build a robot to be used in the brain. But, you know, it's a classic sort of business strategy. You'd spend all this money to build a robot. Neurosurgery is a very small market. So they probably wouldn't make their money back in the, in the short run. And so we just don't have one yet. But it, it, it will happen when the cost of building it. Is, is down. It's the same with ophthalmology, actually. There's still no robotic surgery that can operate inside the eyeball because the structures are too delicate and our yeah. hands are still better than the robots, but I think that's probably going to change in the next uh, five years or so. Yeah. That's uh, pretty amazing uh, technology. You work with other doctors. You mentioned you work with an oculoplastic specialist, with ENT doctors. Mm -hmm. So it's a team effort, basically, when you're doing these surgeries. Yeah, and you know, in, in, in surgical specialties, and I know you appreciate this, we're very siloed. So I trained in neurosurgery, so I learned from neurosurgeons how to do neurosurgery. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that our colleagues are doing in other fields that we don't learn about. You know, you do an internship in it, you, you rotate there for a month or two, you don't really learn anything. Um, and so I found it incredibly eye-opening, no pun intended, to work with other surgeons and see what they were doing, right? And, and they have different equipment and different instruments. And for them, you know, making an incision in the eyelid and going around the eyeball, it's trivial. Like, it's like every day they do that. And right. when I would open up the head and get near the eye, I'd get nervous, like, oh my God, we're near the eye. You know, and when they operate through the eye, they get near the brain. They don't want to see the brain. Right. This brain's a problem. And I'm like, what? The brain? I see, we see the brain every day. What's the big deal? Right. Same thing through the nose, you know? If we get near the sinuses, we get nervous. Oh my God, we're going to get an infection. It's going to get into the brain. Sinus surgeons, they don't want to see the brain. So I learned an incredible amount from these other surgeons. Right. And I would watch them operate and I would see what they were doing and, and see how comfortable they were and how much you can retract on this. 
Um, and because of that collaboration and breaking down the walls of those silos, you realize how much you can accomplish that you didn't realize you could because we're so subspecialized. Right, it's pretty interesting. I once was doing a corneal transplant case and there are special scissors for doing corneal transplant. And the nurse says, oh, they're not in the OR. And I go, well, where are they? She said, I think uh, gynecology borrowed them. I go, what? What, what are they yeah. doing? There? Well, the curvature of the corneal scissor turned out to be perfect for doing fallopian tube surgery. Right. And some gynecologists figured that out probably from a, a colleague. Right. So collaboration is important Super. and sharing uh, technologies. Uh, you also are involved in research and, and uh, clinical trials. Tell us about the importance of that. So um, my, I run a lab, basic science lab, and it's an epilepsy lab. So I um, work in, in mice. I have a mouse model, mice models of, of uh, epilepsy, where we can uh, create little foci of abnormality in, in the mouse. And then we do a lot of imaging. So we have ways now of imaging where we can um, genetically manipulate these mice so that every time a neuron fires, uh, there, it fluoresces a particular color, green, mm. red, whatever color you want. And, and we can now create these mice so that you know, excitatory cells will fluoresce one color, inhibitory cells will fluoresce another color. So we can take a camera suspended over the brain and basically map out this individual cells firing as a seizure starts and spreads through the brain, which you know, we never knew exactly what was happening because we just put electrodes on the brain. You kind right. of get a sense of the fields, the general stuff that's going on, but not neuron by neuron. And that technology is constantly improving, getting faster, higher resolution, more sensitive. So that helps us figure out how do seizures spread in the brain? How, where, what cells do they start in? And then you could say, all right, well, how do we interrupt that? You know, how do we, how do we zap that with a laser? Or how do we give a particular drug? Or optogenetically, which means how do we shine light so that a channel opens on that one cell so it doesn't fire? Um, you know, we can bring all these new techniques in once we really understand how seizures spread through the brain. So that's a basic science thing right. that I do separately from all the surgeries that I do. Wow, so you're working 24-7, or maybe I need, 20... I need more hours in the day. Yeah, 25-8, I think, is, exactly. is what you need. How similar is a mouse brain to a human brain? Obviously, it's much smaller, but are, are there certain parts that are... There are. You know, they, we have a hippocampus, and they have a hippocampus. We have a thalamus. They have a thalamus. You know, they have a layered uh, brain, neocortex, which is what I work in, the neocortex. Um, and they have lobes, you know, parietal, frontal lobe. And, and a lot of the, the connections are the same as well, um, which I'm interested in because a lot of the times what seizures will do is they'll sort of hijack the normal connections of the brain. So you can kind of figure out what parts of the brain are connected to other parts of the brain and how seizures use that. So there are a fair amount of similarities. It's not identical, but... Pretty, Enough. pretty amazing. Um, what I'd like to discuss now is something that's really fascinated me for years, and uh, you're an expert in it, is brain-computer interfaces. Uh, I have this vision that in maybe 10 years, we won't need schools anymore because you go to sleep and download an encyclopedia into your brain overnight and be an expert in Greek or Roman history. Right. That would um, be nice. That would be or neurosurgery. Or neurosurgery, yeah. whatever it is you want, you could download it. Um, I think we're getting kind of close to that. I know you work with a company, Precision Neurosciences, yeah. uh, as a consultant. Yeah. And uh, tell, tell me some more about brain computer interface. Yeah. So, you know, that's something we see on science fiction movies all the time. And there's tons of movies where someone plugs into the you know, a computer and suddenly they're integrated with it. And, you know, can do all of these things. And one of the things I try to talk about, and it's in the very end of the book, where I'm sort of talking, because it's sort of the future of neurosurgery, there's a big difference between taking information out of the brain and putting information into the brain. They're, they're not the same. And right now, we're much better at taking information out of the brain than we are putting information into the brain. So for example, we can put an electrode over the part of the brain that moves your hand, and we can record either from individual neurons or from sort of groups of neurons. And every time you move your hand in a similar way, those neurons will fire in a similar pattern, right? Because the neurons are making the, move hand, the hand move. And if we do it enough times, you can use something called machine learning. So a computer can actually figure out what's the pattern of electrical activity in the brain that I'm recording that makes the hand do this versus this versus this, move my this finger, this finger, this finger, reach here, reach here, reach here. Right. You do that 
activity again and again and again, the neurons fire in the same way, the, a computer will figure that out. Oh, this is the pattern. So once you have the electrodes implanted on the brain and the machine figures out how to translate from brain neuronal firing to the activity, um, it can make a robotic arm do exactly the same thing, right? It can make that translation. Um, and that's an output brain computer interface to control a robotic arm. And we can do that now, right? We can have someone just think about moving their arm and they can move an arm. And you can imagine, and with legs as well, you can make your legs move. Um, and that's getting information out of the brain. Putting information into the brain is much more difficult because the information that comes into the brain comes through very specific neurons that interface on very specific parts of the brain um, and make literally millions of neurons fire in a particular pattern, right? We don't have the ability to make a million different neurons fire in a particular pattern, mm -hmm. which is how you would put information into the brain. We don't know how to do that. We right. can't do that. The only thing we can try, we're starting to do um, is in vision. There's a little bit of work in it, and I could talk about that. Um, sensation, you could do some of that. And then you might think about, well, you know, we have these, um, there is such thing called a retinal implant, and there's a cochlear implant. Right. But those implants, retinal and cochlear implants, don't actually implant into the brain, right? They implant into the retina. Right. So the optic nerve brings the information in. And right. if you implant into the cochlea, the cochlear nerve brings the information in. So you haven't actually, you're not actually inserting the information into the brain. You're inserting it into a peripheral sensory organ. Right. So for vision, it turns out years ago, um, these neurosurgeons like Oster and, and sorry, Furster and Alfred o Furster, um, I'm forgetting the other one's name actually. But anyway, these two neurosurgeons in Germany figured out that if you stimulate the brain uh, in, the, in the visual cortex, um, the patient will see little flashes of light. So if I stimulate the brain in one little area in your visual cortex, you'll see a little light bulb go off here. And so they figured that out. And then another neurosurgeon named Wilder Penfield did more work stimulating the brain in different areas and saw that you could see these flashes of light in different areas. So people started to think, well, if I can put an electrode on the surface of the visual cortex and I can stimulate the brain in a patterned way, maybe I can create little flashes of light and recreate vision. And you can actually do that. And that was done in the 1970s. There was a guy named William Dobell who built a company around this, this whole story behind that. Um, where he created a device where you basically wear a pair of glasses with a camera on it and that records the, the visual information in the world and you put it into a computer and the computer then goes into the brain and stimulates the, the visual cortex to create flashes of light. But the resolution is very poor because you're not actually activating the visual cortex the way it was meant to be activated. Right. You're not activating the individual neurons, you're basically just blasting you know, a bunch of neurons and they all kind of fire in some disorganized way in one particular place so you see a flash of light. So what you could see with that type of vision is sort of the outline of, of what's going on around you in flashes of light, almost like, like a jumbotron from the 1970s or, you know, a pixelated, old pixelated graphic where it was just, you know, a couple of flash bulbs or even like if you imagine um, on the 4th of July when the fireworks go off and they, and they create sort of a figure that you can see, not the drone fancy ones, but just right. like a firework. So you can kind of imagine that with a couple of pixels you get some sort of vision, but it's really not serviceable, useful vision that we're used to. So um, getting information out of the brain, not so hard. Putting information in, very, very hard. And for getting it out, that doesn't just mean, first of all, not only can you move an arm, but for example, if you wanted to fly a plane with your brain, we could do that, right? That's doable. If you wanted to drive a car, with an implant, that's doable because it's a motor output. So every time you think about turning the wheel, you know, you're moving your hands in a particular way, I can interpret those signals and figure that out. Um, so that's doable. Language is also doable. We have a way to take a language out of the brain because every time I speak, I move my, the muscles of my tongue and my mouth in a particular way. So if I say a particular vowel or a consonant, ma, ba, pa, ka, all of those things, I'm moving my mouth in a particular way, and right. if I'm recording from the brain, I can say, figure out what the pattern of my neurons firing in those areas are. So you can take language out of the brain. You can do the same thing with handwriting. Every time I write an A, I do the same thing. Every time I write a B, I do the same thing. So you can figure out the handwriting, take the information out. And so someone can literally just be sitting there and thinking about writing in script, and on a computer screen, the, the words would come out. The words would appear. We can do that. What we can't do is take your thoughts out of your brain. Yet. 
We can't do that yet. We don't know how that happens. We have no idea where that comes from exactly and how that happens, so we can't figure that out. So right. what's nice about that is people worry about privacy. Now, you have a brain-computer interface, like are they reading your mind? Like how do you keep thoughts private? And the truth is right now, all those brain-computer interfaces, if they're gonna take any um, communication out of the brain, you have to willfully articulate it. You can't just think a thought and it'll come out of the brain. You have to articulate that thought through speech or through writing for it to get out of your brain. So you still can maintain your privacy. Right. And I'm sure you know about Neuralink, Elon Musk's company. They yeah. just got FDA approval to yeah. do clinical trials for yeah. a chip that they would implant and it would allow people who are paralyzed to, to actually right. do things through a robot. And then he's got this Optimus robot that is with Tesla. So potentially somebody who's totally paralyzed could have a robot yes. make breakfast for them or you know, take out the garbage. So that technology already exists, right? So that is not an innovation of, um, of Elon Musk's. Um, he's sort of using what can already be done. So we can already put an array of electrodes. Uh, the most common one used is called the Utah Array, which was invented years ago. And it's basically 100 electrodes on a little chip that's about this big. And you can implant it in the brain and take that information out to, to move uh, a robotic arm. What Neuralink is doing, and, and a, it, it's an incredible uh, technology, is they actually have a machine that essentially sews in, or, or almost like hair plugs. You know, you imagine like hair plugs go in. Right. So they'll plug in like a thousand electrodes in a tiny area of the brain. Um, which is a great idea to try to get very, very high resolution information out of the brain. Um, and so just like the Utah Array, which does the same thing, in a smaller area takes information out of the brain, the Neuralink device could also do that. Um, and again, taking information out, motor, controlling a robot, Easy. we know how to do that. Um, that's not so innovative at the moment as opposed to putting information into the, into the brain. The Precision Neuroscience, the other company that I work with, has a different philosophy which is to, instead of putting electrodes directly into the brain, they've developed a, a bigger chip, it's about this big, that sits like a postage stamp, it sits on the surface of the brain. Um, and it records, has a thousand electrodes in the size of a postage stamp, and they've developed a way to put it in in a very minimally invasive way, which I, you know, very um, thoughtful way to do that, because um, the head of the company is a neurosurgeon, oh. um, to put it in and basically take out information in the same way that Neuralink would. It's a, it's a very similar device, but uses a different strategy. I see. How did Neuralink get its FDA approval for clinical trials? You know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I'm sure they put in an application. Right. And, you know, given that there are um, clinical trials going on already at major universities using brain computer interfaces to control robotic arms, it's already happening, right? There's already papers showing that it's published, it's doable. Right. So, um, they, they may not have needed so much approval because it's already being done. I see. Uh, Musk talks about a vision chip in a few years. I guess what you said, it's, it's much harder to put in the vision than to take out. How many years do you think it, it will take for us to... Yeah, I mean, I think it'll be decades, honestly. Decades. Because it, it may be, because you need to get the information into the optic nerves, in a way. You need to get them into the into the white matter, you know, we, when you put something right on the gray matter of the brain, it's not, it's not how the brain is meant to get information into it. It's meant to come in through incoming neurons, through the axons that synapse in the right way. And if you bypass that, you're not gonna get the brain to function in the way it's supposed to function. Now, is it possible that if you did an implant like that in an infant or a baby, and the brain is still plastic, and is still learning how to process information, could that be more functional? And the answer is probably it could. Mm -hmm. um, because you know there's this, this plasticity period of a couple of years where the brain is very plastic and it's basically forming all of its connections. It basically means it's figuring out how to interpret the incoming information and make sense of the external world. There's a period of time where the brain does that, after which it doesn't really do that very well anymore. So in an adult, if you don't use the programmed inputs, which is the, the white matter, as we call it, that is coming in, um, and you try to just put something on the surface of the brain, the brain's not really going to know how to interpret it, which is why you just see these flashes of light. You don't see objects. Right. 
Um, so I'm not sure what Musk's strategy is. You know, I, I don't know. Um, so I think, you know, the other option would be maybe if you could put some drugs on the brain, some chemicals that would increase the plasticity of that area of the brain so that it would sort of rewire itself so that the incoming information could be interpreted in a different way. That might be possible. Or if you could implant a chip in the white matter so that it comes in through the normal inputs. You mentioned white matter and gray matter. Can you tell us what difference is? And by the way, your book is titled Gray Matters. Gray Matters. Yeah. Right. Well, so what's I'm the difference there. between white matter and gray matter? So gray matter are the neurons, it's the surface of the brain, there's some deep, but mostly on the surface, um, which are the, the bodies of the neurons themselves, which do all the calculating. Neurons are the nerve cells. Those are the nerve cells, correct. And then those neurons talk to other neurons by basically sending wires, right? It's like a communication wire. And those wires are the white matter. So basically most of the brain is made up of the communication, the wiring pattern. Um, from cell to cell, and the reason why it's white is that it's covered with this fatty substance called myelin, so it looks whiter. Um, but it's really, the white matter is all the communication from cell to cell. It's like fiber optic, you know, cables. So how does a three and a half pound brain have computing ability that's far superior to tons and tons of computers and wires that we have today? And do you think we'll ever match it with artificial intelligence? Yeah. Uh, you know, evolution is a very powerful uh, process. It took a few billion years. It took a few billion years, right? <laughs> but um, it works, and we know that, you know. So um, I think that because I do believe that the brain is just a very sophisticated computer, um, that eventually we'll get there when we have complex enough computers that also can change the strength of their connections, which they, you know, they do sort of use artificial intelligence. Um, but the complexity, you know, is enormous. It just has to become so much more complex right. to reach the, the complexity of the human brain. Uh, I want to discuss a few things I read in your book, which to me are, are fascinating. You you discuss a little bit about football injuries to the head yeah. and concussions. That's a big news item in the last few years. There have been a lot of football players who premature dementia and other problems. So what, what's the story with injuries to the head? Should kids be playing football? Yeah, so... Should kids be playing soccer and heading soccer yeah. balls? Um, it's pretty clear now that um, multiple blows to the head over a prolonged period of time um, leads to a disease called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE. And it's um, a degeneration of the brain cells um, and deposition of proteins in the brain. And it can occur from a lot of different things, right? So we think of it from football and we get a lot of hits to the head. And it's not just a concussion, right? It's what we call subconcussive injuries, which are these minor, minor traumatic brain injuries. Like every time a football player hits another football player, there's a minor brain injury there. And that can occur not only from football, it can occur from boxing. Um, there's now reports out, you know, a lot of these um, uh, in the military where they're shooting these uh, shoulder-mounted rockets. Mm -hmm. Every time they shoot a rocket, the there's down. a blow to the head. It's not just a blow to the head, there's a pressure wave through the head. And they've realized that a lot of these people are getting something like CTE. They have scarring mm -hmm. in their brain. And then over time, if they do it enough times repetitively, you know, you can become depressed and anxious and confused and it leads to psychological issues. So what we don't understand is who, why do some people get it and other people don't, right? That's the mystery, right? Because there are a lot of football players who played their whole careers and they seem cognitively fine. So there's gotta be some sort of genetic predisposition mm -hmm. that leads some people to have it and other people don't. I mean, people get hit all the time, you know, have a cardiomyopathy and you can die on a basketball court it's because you've got a problem you know, there's, there's an issue going on so there's probably some genetic predisposition that leads to that so it's got to be a lot of hits over a, a period of time so you know should children not play football um, there are now reports of you know 20 year old 30 year old younger people who are having this problem I think what it's going to come down to is eventually we're going to have a test that's going to tell you you are predisposed to CTE you should not play football you can play football, you're not previous. You don't have a genetic, pre we'll have a test that so we can do. do. Blood tests and you check for certain genes right. and then you figure it right. out. Um, or we'll do it and we'll do, you know, you'll get hit and they'll do an eye movement 
you know, analysis and we'll just make sure that you're doing okay. Well, better sideline testing. Um, actually, eye movements is very much more sensitive to concussion than anything else. We think about pupils, but really eye movements is probably the most sensitive test we have now, one of the most sensitive. So um, the other thing is that we obviously benefit a lot by playing sports. You know, my kids played hockey and I would definitely get worried. There were a couple times my, my kids would come off and they would get hit in the head and they were like, you know, 10 years old, 12 years old, and they'd be like, Dad, my head really hurts. And I'd be thinking, oh my God, what am I doing to my, is this worth it? Right. But what they got out of it, sort of the camaraderie and learning how to play on a team, you know, there's so much we benefit from sports that I'm not willing to say that we should just hang up all, you know, high school sports, but I think if you're gonna play college football and professional football, um, you need to be aware of the risks and the risks are great. Um, but that's why they get paid so much money. What about soccer? Young kids playing soccer and heading the ball. Yeah. My kids used to make fun of me because when they played baseball, I used to make them wear the plastic helmets before it was popular. And I know they thought I was nuts, but I was always afraid they would get hit in the head. Right. So the question is, how many hits do you need? How many of these small hits do you need until you cause damage? I don't know the answer to that. We don't really know. But I think if you're just playing through high school, you're probably pretty safe. Although, and I write about it in the book, there, there, you can, you can die playing high school football. I mean, there are high school football right. players who have gotten hit and have something called second impact syndrome, where they basically their brain starts to swell. Now, it's incredibly rare. Uh, How but it soon can after the injury? Very, pretty soon after. Okay. They call it second impact syndrome, but a lot of the times it's a first hit. Um, they sort of think, well, if you get one concussion, you get another concussion. Soon afterwards, you're at higher risk. That's why it's called second impact syndrome. But um, a lot of the times, it's the first hit that causes the problem. And sometimes it's not the second hit, but it's the fifth hit that causes the problem. So again, there's probably a genetic predisposition. There's probably some kind of hit that they get that's bad enough. And the, a young child's brain is very big. There's not a lot of room. As you get older, your brain starts to shrink. We're losing like 50 million neurons a day. It's very sad yeah. to think about, it, but it's true. It's so our brains are kind of atrophying over time. But when you're young, you've got all the neurons you're gonna have, and so there's not a lot of room in there. And so if you get the right kind of hit, hmm. what happens is that your blood vessels in the brain will dilate and the pressure goes up, and that can cause serious injury to, uh, you know, and even death. If they don't go in, the neurosurgeon can go in quickly and like remove half the skull to let the pressure out, otherwise it can be deadly. It's very rare, but it can happen. What's damaged? Is it the gray matter, white matter, or both? All of it. All of it is damaged. So the yeah. wiring and the cells. Yeah. All right. Uh, one other thing you discussed uh, in your book, which was uh, really awesome reading, great reading, Thank you. Um, is cell phone radiation. Yeah. Now, in 1995, I actually got a U.S. patent for a device that oh, wow. blocks cell phone radiation because I heard of a couple of cases of this. I actually got a patent. I contacted the cell phone company to see yeah. if they were interested. They denied that there's any yeah. uh, association, yet there are a few people who worked on the original cell phones who died from brain tumors. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think is going on? So look, the story is compelling, right? You, it, you think of it like cigarette smoking. You've got a big business, cell phones. They want to make money. They want you to buy their phone. If you say that it's dangerous, they're gonna be like, of course it's not dangerous. You know, we funded a study showing it's not dangerous, right. but you know, you can't believe the study they funded. So the story makes us worried, you know, because we lived through the whole cigarette crisis. But the truth is, if you look at all the studies that have been done, these are studies not done by cell phone companies as well, um, and you put them all together, and what they do is they'll, they'll have, um, you know, whatever, 100,000 people who used a cell phone you know, on the right or on the left, the right hand or the left, and, they, and a certain percentage of them will get brain tumors. And you sort of ask them, you know, how often did you use your cell phone? And they're having to remember what hand they used and how often they used it. And there's a lot of errors in those studies. But when you put all the information together, there's a couple of studies that show maybe a little bit of an increase. And then there's just as many studies that actually show that you have fewer brain tumors, right? But you don't hear about the studies that show um, the cell phone users had fewer brain tumors. The, the press only picks up on the ones right. that show more. So when you put them all together, you do like a meta-analysis or a systematic review, it really doesn't wash out that cell phones cause any brain tumors. And then you look at the science. Like, so how, what's the mechanism? How would that happen? Like, we understand how cigarette smoke, there's carcinogens in there that can cause lung cancer. You think about radiation, it sounds bad. Radiation sounds bad, but not all radiation is the same. In fact, visible light is a form of radiation. There's right. an electromagnetic spectrum 
you've got ultraviolet, you've got infrared, you've got gamma rays and x-rays on one side, that's dangerous, right? You want to stay away from gamma rays and x-rays. Then you go to the other side, you get microwaves, you get cell phones. Um, those don't break DNA bonds, right? They don't alter the DNA. And right now, in order to, for something to be a carcinogen, it has to alter your DNA, right? It has to alter your, you have to mutate your DNA so that the cell, the cell starts dividing um, and can't stop dividing, or it has to alter whatever protects those cells from, from their division. So right now, we don't, we don't know a mechanism. The only thing a cell phone does is it heats up whatever it's next to just a little, little tiny bit. Right. It gets a little bit warmer, but like a trivial amount, like 0.1 degree, you know, nothing that we think causes damage. So we don't have a mechanism whereby cell phones cause brain tumors. We don't have any epidemiologic evidence. In other words, a big study showing right. that, yeah, if you use your cell phone more, you get a brain tumor. We don't have any of that. So there really is not a great mechanism to show, even in children, that cell phones cause brain tumors. So at this point, I use a phone, my kids use a phone, and I'm not worried about it. I use my speaker phone whenever I can, so that phone is as far away from my brain yeah, as if you're possible. Yeah, if you're more comfortable, yeah. more power to you. The bigger risk of cell phones, honestly, is texting and driving. Right. There's a ton of accidents. That More people die from that than anything else. So if you're worried about cell phones causing deaths, you probably should stop texting while you drive and not worry so much about brain tumors. Right. I see that every day in the streets here in Manhattan, people driving and texting. Uh, one other uh, thing that I saw in the book, which I wasn't aware of, uh, is that President Biden apparently had a, a brain bleed many, many years ago. Yeah. Is that right? Well, he, yeah, he, he had a brain bleed and he had what's called an aneurysm. An aneurysm okay. is a little... Um, ballooning of a blood vessel. It's a weakness, of a, like if you um, if your tire hits the curb, you know, you get a little bump when it gets weak. As that grows bigger and bigger and bigger, it can eventually rupture. Mm. So Biden had a aneurysm that ruptured many years ago, and he had to go in for emergency surgery to have it fixed. Wow. And it's a great story because his surgeon was, uh, he had two surgeons, Eugene George, neurosurgeon, and, and Neil Cassell. Neil Cassell is actually, um, only has one eye, Hmm. And never graduated from high school. Really? Yeah. So the story. How, how did he become? Yeah, exactly. So I tell a story like, how did the president of the United States' life get saved by a neurosurgeon who only has one eye and never graduated from high school? So the story. So neurosurgery can't be that hard. Exactly. After all. It's not that hard. Right. It's all a mess. Um, the <laughs> cell story is great. And I actually I interviewed him because I wanted to make sure I got it right because I was going to write about it and I'd read stuff online. And I was like, this can't be true. Like, there's no way he didn't graduate from high school. How is that possible? So, the story is that he was, he'd go to high school and he wasn't, he wasn't really paying that much attention, he wasn't doing that well, and his family basically said, oh, no, he didn't graduate from college, I think it was. Oh. I think he graduated from high school and he didn't graduate from college. Okay. I think that was it. I gotta, I'll, I'll look back. I know, I just wrote about it and I'm already forgetting. But, so the story was that he, um, he worked over the summers. He got a summer job working for a guy named Thomas Langfit. Thomas Langfit was the head of neurosurgery at the University of Pennsylvania. And it was a time when there weren't that many neurosurgery residents around. So Cassell was so into neurosurgery and working in, in Langfitt's lab that he published all these papers. And then when surgeries would come up, Langfitt would be like, hey, why don't you come help me? So he started assisting him. Right. And he, um, got into, he started doing, he got into the University of Pennsylvania and he was working with Langfitt the whole time. He was writing papers with him. He was assisting him in the operating room. You know, he was as good as a lot of the residents who were training there. And Langfitt went to the um, head of the medical school and said, if you let this guy into the med school, I'm going to give him a spot in my residency program. Hmm. And I think at that point, he wasn't doing very well in college because he was spending so much time working in Langfitt's lab, publishing papers, and assisting him in the operating room, that he wasn't focusing on college. Right. I'll have to check that up. Sorry, Neil, I'm forgetting the details. But... Um, so the, he basically said they, they let him graduate from college, even without all his credits. Right. And he, they basically pushed him into med school. He finished med school, and he, got, he trained uh, there and became a very talented uh, neurosurgeon at the University of Virginia. And he was born with something called microphthalmia, which you can explain what that is. You yeah, it's basically a that tiny thing. eye that doesn't function, doesn't have all the proper anatomical structures. Right. So he only had one eye. And I, so I said to him, I'm like, what is that like? He goes, I can ski. I can you know, ride a bike. He says he can do everything he wants with one eye. That he's figured it out. And 
if you think about brain plasticity, yeah, it adapts. Um, the brain adapts, right? But there's one thing the brain can adapt to. We have something called stereo vision, where the two eyes together allow us to judge yes. depth. So if, like you mentioned, clipping an aneurysm is scary the first time you do it as, as a resident, how do you clip an aneurysm if you don't have depth, right. depth of feel? Because so, it's the same in eye surgery. I'm working in a two or three millimeter space. Right. So you'll appreciate this. We talked a lot about endoscopic surgery. And as you know, a lot of surgeons do surgery with endoscopes. And I do very fine brain surgery around the optic nerves with an endoscope. So an endoscope only has one lens and one light source. It's and true. it projects it on a screen. And it's right. a 2D screen. Right. So every time we do endoscopic surgery, we're operating in two dimensions. We're not, we have no 3D depth of field. Right. And the question is, how do we do it? And so right. what happens is, as you're operating, when you move an instrument in and out, you get this knowledge of depth of field by the movement. There's this also what's called parallax. You get a sense of where things are based on other objects that are moving around near them. And you can recreate the depth of field by having instruments moving around, and your brain has a way to do that. Right, so you're passing different anatomical structures, and since you know the anatomy so well, you know exactly and you, But you also you see the instruments you're moving in and how it changes the size, right? If right. I move something deeper and closer, and I move another instrument deeper and closer, it's gonna change its size as it moves, as it triangulates in. All that information gets integrated in your brain, and you can operate very, very carefully in two dimensions. So I was skeptical like you were, right? Um, and then I realized that I've been operating in two dimensions all this time. And then I also um, got very involved in a company uh, called Vision Sense at the time that made a 3D endoscope for neurosurgery. It's another great story. This guy, Avi Aron is his name, he actually had brain, so he had a colloid cyst removed. Um, and he had it done open without a scope. And the surgeon told him, well, the endoscope's only two-dimensional. I can't really operate in two dimensions. So he took it upon himself. He's an engineer. He invented a three-dimensional endoscope for neurosurgery. And I worked with him to sort of make it smaller and make it work in, in, um, in neurosurgery. And we have other companies that Stortz makes a 3D endoscope. There are other small now right. endoscopes. And I've used them. And honestly, I'm now more comfortable operating in two dimensions, right. particularly in high definition, you know, in 4K, um, that the 3D endoscopes look funny to me. They just they don't look natural. Which, so this is bizarre phenomenon where now yeah. we're more comfortable. With your, your brain does have some plasticity. I have patients who lose an eye during adulthood, and yeah. initially they feel off balance and are uncertain. They have trouble driving cars. But eventually, as they go along, they get used to it, and the brain figures out other ways to, to figure out depth perception. Yeah. So uh, plasticity doesn't and completely, there's still some... There's plasticity, and there's also calculate, like taking in new information and figuring out how to integrate it. Right. Uh, there was an interesting section in, in your book. Uh, you called it psychosurgery versus... Uh, psychosurgeon. Psych psychosurgery or psychosurgeon. Right, exactly. Tell us about, about that. That yeah. goes back a while, but it's important. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, one of the things I wanted to do in this book was sort of look at at some of the stereotypes and the myths of um, brain surgeons. You know, one is, is sort of the Harvey Cushing myth that like we're all these sort of brilliant Renaissance person who can, is facile and can do everything and neurosurgery is so hard and that's sort of the Harvey Cushing model. And the other one is sort of the mad scientist, like the person who takes advantage of the fact that they're in your brain, that they're gonna control you or that you're gonna, they're gonna screw you up or you're gonna wake up different than when you went to sleep. So. That whole myth really comes from this era of psychosurgery, which when I trained in neurosurgery, nobody ever talked about. Mm. It was like this secret. And a lot of people don't know about it. You sort of do a little bit. And you know, you know, there was something called a frontal lobotomy. What was the frontal lobotomy? People make jokes. I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. What was that about? <laughs> you ever heard that one? I haven't heard that one. Yeah. So um, the frontal lobotomy was a surgery that was invented by a guy named Egas Moniz, who's a Port Portuguese neurologist. He wasn't a neurosurgeon, he was a neurologist. And how he thought of it is actually remarkable, because it was, this was back in the 1950s, and he went to a conference, and someone um, presented data on two chimpanzees. Two. Two. Who had had their frontal lobes removed, and in one of those chimpanzees, they 
they, they were, had done some tasks that made them anxious, and after that was done, they were less anxious. Hmm. Now, they, now, it turns out they couldn't even, the tasks that they were able to do very fastly before, they were no longer able to do very well. But one of them was a little less anxious and frustrated by another test that, that they couldn't do. So he took this data from one chimpanzee who got a little less anxious, ignored the fact that they could no longer do this complex banana getting task, whatever, and decided to try it on patients who were schizophrenic. Really? They went back to Peru and got a, another neurosurgeon um, named Lima to help him. And they would basically make um, holes on either side of the skull here, and they would take a little loop called a leucotone. They would go in and they would just basically sweep it back and forth and disconnect the frontal lobes. And they found that some patients actually got better, seemed to get better. They seemed to be less you know, anxious. They seemed to be less um, sort of crazy and schizophrenic. Whatever metric they were using, it was a very crude metric that they were using. So fast forward, there's a neurologist living in the US named Walter Freeman, and he's at Georgetown. And he gets a job at a psychiatric hospital. And in those days, there was no treatment for mental illness. So if you were, had severe depression or you had schizophrenia, we had nothing to give you. So you would basically get admitted to a hospital where you would sit in a corner by yourself for the rest of your life. That was it. And they would try these crazy things like they would you know, put you in very hot water or very cold water. Or they'd give you insulin and lower your glucose because they didn't know, they had no idea. They were basically torturing you and you would get mistreated by the staff there. That's the whole one flow of the cuckoo's nest model of treatment of mental illness. So, to be fair to him, there, there was no alternative. So he reads this article about Moniz and he goes, oh, some of the people got better, you know, maybe we'll try it. So he starts doing this operation and he gets a neurosurgeon to help him do it. Um, and again, making, again, under general anesthesia, they made little holes in the top of the skull and they would put this instrument down and sweep it back and forth and disconnect the frontal lobes. And sure enough, some patients got better, many patients got much worse. And many patients were completely incapacitated one of which was um, Joe Kennedy's daughter, um, JFK's sister, RFK's sister, um, named Rosemary. She had a frontal lobotomy by Walter Freeman, and she was devastated by this and never recovered from it. Mm. Um, but Walter Freeman, who was a showman and had a big ego and wanted to make his mark on the world and wanted to impress everyone, um, he was actually related to another famous nurse, first person to take out a, nurse, a brain tumor in the U.S. His like, grandfather was a famous neurosurgeon, so he wanted to be a famous doctor as well. Um, so he started doing lobotomies and doing more and more, and he started to get frustrated by the fact that he had to let his neurosurgeon do the lobotomies. And he, he was a neurologist psychiatrist. He wanted to do it on his own. And so he read an article written by an Italian, Fiamberti, it's this Italian's name, who figured out that you could actually do the same operation. Remember we talked about transorbital surgery? Right. If you pick up the eyelid mm -hmm. and you put basically an ice pick below the eyelid, above the eyeball, and you jam it through the roof of the frontal bone there, so it's incredibly thin, right. the bone above the orbit's very thin. You jam it up there, you can go right into the brain, and you could sweep it back and forth from below. So you do it one on this side and one on this side, and you sweep them back and forth. And he realized that he could do this without a neurosurgeon. He could do it on his own. The problem was anesthesia, right? How do you anesthetize the patients? Because I need an anesthesiologist. So he figured out, well, I'm allowed to do ECT, which is electroconvulsive therapy, where you basically put electrodes on, on a depressed patient's head and you give them a seizure. And after someone has a seizure, they're very sort of out of it. They're lethargic and confused after your seizure. So he would basically, in order to become independent, he would give them ECT that they didn't need. Mm -hmm. He would then, they would be lethargic. He would then unsterily jam this ice pick above their eyelid into their brain and sweep <clears throat> it back and forth, all right? It sounds crazy. He would do, he could do it in about 15 minutes and he would do 25 in a day. He would go from psychiatric institute to psychiatric institute doing, and there were maybe 60,000 frontal lobotomies done in America like from 1950 to 1970, in that period of time, roughly. So it was this big treatment, and then everyone realized that it, it was hurting more people than it was helping. And then a drug called Thorazine came around to treat right. schizophrenia, so um, we didn't need to be doing frontal lobotomies anymore. Um, but he was a fanatic, and he would go around doing case after case after case 
Um, and you know, he would publish pictures of his before and after pictures of these patients as if he was selling a diet drug, you know what I mean? Just trying to promote it. So it, it was, it was um, really interesting for me to look back at what happened. Um, most of the, there were lobotomies being done by neurosurgeons, but the guy who really promoted it more than anyone was not a neurosurgeon. He was actually a neurologist. And the neurosurgeons who did it, some of them did some very careful studies where they would work with psychiatrists and they would do a sterile operation where they would remove a little part of the brain um, and, and then have a psychiatrist blinded, in other words, not knowing sort of who had the surgery and who didn't, right. and then check again and see if they got any better. Um, and it turns out there, there, are a, there were a percentage of patients, maybe 20%, who actually got better from this surgery, who went back to work. And we don't quite understand, you know, we, we have operations we can do now that are much more sophisticated. Um, but more, so many people were hurt by the operation that it was yeah. abandoned, you know, and not many neurosurgeons ended up doing it. And, and I talk a lot about the neurosurgeons that did. Um, there's some great stories about, you know, Ava Perón, who, Avita, you know, was the, the married to Juan Perón in, in um, Argentina. Right. Um, she had a frontal a lobotomy done near the end of her life. And when a neurosurgeon from America actually flew down and did it on her, and, and a lot of people think she never knew that she was having it done. It was kind of forced on her. There's a whole story behind that because it was very hidden that she had that surgery done. Wow, that's that's really incredible. Speaking of the Kennedys, you brought up the Kennedys. Yeah. Recently, there was news coming out about JFK, President Kennedy, that he was shot from multiple directions by right. different people. You have right. a section on Kennedy. I what, do. What, you know, there's a documentary that that was done that just came out on Paramount. I couldn't get on to, I wanted to watch it because it was on Paramount. I couldn't log in for some reason. But um, yeah, so what I did was I, I wanted to use the Kennedy assassination as a way to teach just sort of basic neuroanatomy, right? I wanted to find a, a way to introduce people to what's the difference between the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the cerebellum, which are the basic, you know, the brain has four lobes, frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal, and the cerebellum is this like little, sub-brain in the back. And so I use the Kennedy assassination because um, there was a controversy. You know, he was shot in the back of the head. And he was exam examined by a neurosurgeon um, called um, Kemp Clark, Walter Kemp Clark. And Kemp, as he, it was sort of, as he had a nickname named Kemp, examined him from behind. And in his original report, he didn't find an entrance wound. He says there was no entrance wound in the back. Mm. Um, all he found, he thought that the bullet had grazed the side of, the, of Kennedy's head. And it turns out, and, and that was very controversial, because if he was shot from behind, you know, how is there no entrance wound? And then he also said that he saw um, cerebellum leaking through the, 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 the wound which doesn't make sense based on where, where it was. Right, because the cere cerebellum is all the way to back and back. Back here. And yeah. so it turns out there was another neurosurgeon in the hospital where Kemp was doing his examination, who was six months out of his residency. And mm -hmm. no one took his testimony. Nobody spoke to him. His name was Bob Grossman. He became the chair in, at Texas Methodist Hospital. And he um, eventually published an article 40 years later and he said, this is what I remember from Kennedy's assassination. And so he remembers very clearly that there was an entrance wound here, and it was in, it was in the occipital lobe. And it turns out the occipital bone covers the cerebellum and the occipital lobe. And, the, and, and they're right, sorry, the occipital lobe and the cerebellum, they're right next to each other. Right. So there was some brain oozing out. You know, Kemp Clark couldn't really tell the difference. Um, Bob Grossman said it, there was clearly an entrance wound. I don't know why Kemp didn't write about it, but there's no question that we felt an entrance wound back here, and there was an exit. The exit wound was here, which is kind of where everything kind of shattered out. So, I use that whole story to sort of introduce people to the four lobes of the brain and the bones, because then I go on and talk about them more, and I kind of want to get them interested in it. And it was sort of this interesting fact that I found, and, and neurosurgeons know this, like we've all read this article that was published in the Journal of Neurosurgery about Bob Grossman who was there, who basically said, I don't know why Clark didn't see the entrance wound, but it was clearly recognizable. Maybe they were on call too much and were tired. Who knows? Yeah, who but knows? now I just saw the other day, Rob Reiner, who's in showbiz, apparently 
has some new film that shows that there were three or four people who shot Kennedy. It's, it's kind of bizarre. I'm we'll not sure. Not yeah. sure if we're, we'll ever uh, figure that out. What, one other person you discuss in your book, which is fascinating, is Muhammad Ali, the boxer. Yeah. And what what happened to him? So we all know that Ali developed Parkinson's disease, right? He was very open about it, um, and he couldn't really hide it, right? So he had to be open about it. Um, he never got an autopsy. So whether boxing contributed to his Parkinson's disease was always a question. Um, but I did speak to his neurologist, his actually his Parkinson neurologist, and you know after reading a lot about it, it, it was clear to me that boxing definitely contributed. And there, there's something called dementia pugilistica, which is an old um, malady that was described in 1973, something like that. And basically, these neurologist doctors realized that boxers would get punch drunk. There's something called being punch drunk. Right. We all heard about that. You get hit in the head enough, you're not quite right. You know, you're not quite the same. And so, what punch drunk is, and dementia pugilistica is the, the official Latin name, is basically these boxers near the end of the life would get something like chronic traumatic encephalopathy, like what the football players would get. Um, and there's a, a broad range of what repetitive head injury can do to the brain. And some people have more cognitive issues. So we hear about these um, football players or hockey players who commit suicide and you know they become very angry. They have more gray matter damage. But there's another group that gets movement disorders like Parkinson's disease. We know that repetitive head trauma can cause Parkinson's disease. Mm. And actually there are studies showing that even football players have a higher risk of Parkinson's disease from their repetitive head trauma. So there's this sort of spectrum by which head trauma causes injuries to the brain, and some of the symptoms can be movement disorder, Parkinson's syndromes. And so that's what Muhammad Ali had. I also write about Michael J. Fox, obviously another famous person yeah. who had Parkinson's disease. Now Michael J. Fox had mostly tremor, and he had a surgery to try to slow down his tremor. And um, Muhammad Ali never had surgery, and one of the reasons was that tremor really wasn't his big problem. He was having more cognitive slowing issues, actually. Uh, and the Parkinson's surgery that we do, deep brain stimulation, doesn't really work for that. It works better for the tremor, which is why Michael J. Fox had surgery and Muhammad Ali didn't. Although Muhammad Ali got a consult from a Mexican neurosurgeon, um, Madrasso was his name, who um, was, had a clinical trial where he was doing transplants of adrenal cells. Because the problem with Parkinson's disease, you don't have enough dopamine in part of the brain. And so the adrenal cells make dopamine or norepinephrine, similar drug, and, and he would transplant the, the adrenal cells into the brain to try to stop Parkinson's disease. And there are all these trials that have gone or, on over the years of transplanting different cells or doing gene therapy or things like that, any way to increase dopamine in that part of the brain to try to treat Parkinson's disease. So Ma Ali actually went down to consult with him but never went through the surgery. How does the deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's work? What, what are you actually doing there? So what you do is you're actually turning off certain cells. The electrode goes into an area to turn down cells that project somewhere else in the brain to help with the tremor. So you're sort of shutting off because with the electrical stimulation at just the right frequency, you can basically shut down a bunch of cells. So if you put it in just the right place, the projections of those neurons will help reduce the tremor. Uh, your book is amazing because it has all these stories in it that were really uh, fascinating. How, how long did it take you to do that? Book? You know, it took me about a year. I wrote a year. it yeah, in 2021. Yeah. I spent the whole year writing the book. Um, and then I, I had written this entire this book. This is like between 2 and 4 in the morning, right? Okay. Um, Saturday and Sunday morning. Saturday. You know, in the winters when I couldn't play golf, I would, I would write. <laughs> so you got to do something with your free time. Um, so it took about a year. And then, you know, but I had this 550-page book which was too long, um, and I didn't know what to do with it. So I started. I spoke to some friends of mine who were writers, and they're like, you know, you can't really sell the entire book. That's not the way the publishing industry works. First, you need to get an agent, um, and then the agent sells it to a publisher. I was like, all right, so I have to send, get an agent. So I sent out the book. They recommended a bunch of different agents, um, and I got rejected by a lot of agents, but I, really? someone said yes. Yeah, you know, you never know. People, it's not what they're interested in. Maybe they didn't read, it's, a, it's a long, you know. And I'm sure they thought, you know, who's going to read a 550-page book about um, neurosurgery? Now, it's much shorter. I'm just saying it's much shorter. We edited it down significantly. But 
So no, it was great, and I, I think the public will enjoy it because it's not technically complicated. It's, it's language you can understand, but uh, it really opens your mind, no, no pun intended. Yeah, yeah, no, it's meant to be for anybody interested in learning about the brain and surgery. It's not a technical book. Um, and I just try to tell stories, you know, try to tell a story of neurosurgery. So, but the next step after you get an agent is you have to, she has to sell it, he or she has to sell it to a, a publisher and they want a 100 page writing sample and like a four page summary and then an outline of where all the chapters are gonna show. And so I basically had to then work to get this long thing into something that I could sell right. to a publisher, which I realized, you know, that's the way it's supposed to be done. But then it was easier for me, because normally you just sell a writing sample and an idea, and the publisher says, yeah, I like that, and then you have to write the book. I'd already written the book. So what I had to do was edit it down to a digestible form, you know, so it wasn't sort of too long. So did you write the book just for yourself, your own self-satisfaction, and then yeah. later decide, hmm, maybe I can actually sell this? Well, I mean, I, I can't say I wrote it not hoping that someday it would get published, right? right? So obviously I thought, wow, maybe this would be published. But... Um, I just wrote it because I, I enjoy writing. I was a philosophy and English major in oh, really? college. Um, I really like writing. Um, I like reading, you know, so I like thinking about ideas and expressing yeah. them and talking about them, so it was fun. Well, I think it's gonna be a bestseller, and as I mentioned earlier, it's already available on Amazon. Uh, you can pre-order it, and it's, it's called Gray Matters, a biography of uh, brain science, and it's really uh, fascinating. I spent the whole day yesterday reading it. I thought I was just going to look at it for a few minutes, but it was uh, so good that I spent uh, a lot Thanks. of time on it. I appreciate that. Thank yeah, so thank you very much uh, for coming today, for taking the time to come here. I know My you're pleasure. a very busy schedule. I think the uh, watchers and listeners out there will enjoy this tremendously. Thank you for having me. My I really pleasure. appreciate it. Yeah, Thank, great to meet you, Robert. Much. Yep, it was great. a pleasure. Thank you all.